to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. You could imagine so great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless
Jesus have my heart, my will, my soul. Jesus have my hopes, my dreams, my world. With joy I lay it down. With joy I cast my crown. Jesus have it all. To you I bring my praise.
Thank you, worship team. That was beautiful. <laughs> Welcome, ladies. It's so good to be back with you tonight. I'm so happy to see you all here. Those of you who came out in light of the time change, I know when it's those winter months and we set our clock back and it starts getting dark earlier, it's so hard to want to go back out of the house again. I don't know about you, but I'm all ready to put those covers over my head and call it a day and stay home where it's comfy and cozy. But I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're in the house of God. And I'm glad for your desire to want to study his word because, oh, this is our lifeline as God's people. Amen. Is the word of God. So did you notice how we just seem to go from Halloween to Christmas and there's no mention of Thanksgiving. It's like, whatever happened to Thanksgiving? Well, ladies, I am all about Thanksgiving. I am not going to just go from ghouls and goblins to gimme, gimme, gimme to Christmas. I am going to celebrate Thanksgiving. And you know, my favorite part of Thanksgiving is actually the stuffing. I, I can't do this no carb thing. That, that is so not me. I love my bread. I love my carbs. I love my stuffing. And I am so looking forward to giving gratitude gratitude to God for our many, many blessings. We have so much to be thankful for. So uh, it's just around the corner and I'm so, so excited. Open your, Bible, your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 5. We are going to look at Isaiah chapters 5 and 6 this evening. And let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we just bow our hearts before you. And Lord, our hearts just so resonate with that song, that beautiful hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Oh Lord, thank you. Thank you so much. That is our testimony. And Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. Even this week, God, how we were just reminded of how high and exalted you are. Oh, Lord, may we just have a renewed sense of your glory tonight, Father. And as the title of our study says, Behold Your God, may we do that exactly here tonight. Father, may you pour out your spirit upon us, Lord, each and every one of us. Give us ears to hear, give us hearts, Lord, with that soil that is receptive to the seed of the word of God and bear fruit for your kingdom. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. 
The title of our study tonight is The Vineyard and the Vision. And the first point we're going to look at is in Isaiah chapter 5, and it's going to be the vineyard. Now, I am not necessarily um, interested in vineyards or, you know, take much thought about vineyards or how grapes grow. But the closest thing I can think about is when I was growing up, I grew up in Ontario, which is about 60 miles southeast from here. And back in the 60s, there was this plot of land in Ontario that was full of vineyards. And I remember going down this one street with my parents. And as a child, I just remember those vineyards. And one of the main streets in Ontario is called Vineyard Street. And I remember them always just having grapes and just just laden with all this lush fruit. And as a child, I remember taking note of that. And then not too long after that, as I became a teenager, I remember going by that strange, that same street and all of those vineyards were gone. They had been completely demolished and they had built a track of homes in their place. But that's about the only thing that I can visualize as far as a vineyard and the things that we read about in our chapter this morning, but I think we all have a pretty good idea. We've all come in contact with a vineyard or, or have, have maybe traveled to Napa Valley and seen vineyards or vineyards in our comings and goings, and we have a pretty good idea of what it was that the Lord was trying to say to us in his word. And I found this beautiful image, if we could put up that image, of a, um, a trip advisor had the, the, good, the, good, the good vineyard. The, the healthy vineyard. Can we get that vision? There it is. TripAdvisor had labeled this as the number one vineyard in Israel. And ladies, if you look at that vineyard, you see the attention to detail. It is green. It is thriving. It is lush. But it is well-maintained and it is well cared for. And I love that vision because as we read God's word this week, that's exactly what he expected from his people to thrive, to be fruitful, to flourish, and to honor all of that hard work that God had invested in the lives of his beloved so for our first point tonight in Isaiah chapter 5, we are going to look at the vineyard. Let's start by reading verses 1 through 7. Let me sing now for my well-beloved, a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile field. He dug all around it, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in the middle of it and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it waste and it will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain no rain. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress." So here we have this beautiful picture like that image that we just saw where God is painting for us a picture of his chosen people and how God had cared for his chosen people with such detail, such concern, 
such attention to everything that they would need in order to live lives that were fully satisfied, but that could most glorify him. There was nothing left for God to do that he hadn't already done. He provided for it. He protected it. He watched over it. He moved all of the things that could possibly get in their way as a hindrance, the stones, those things that can cause the roots sometimes to get choked out, the thorns, everything. He fertilized it. He watched over it. He built hedges to protect it so that wild beasts could not come in and devour his most precious possession. He built a watchtower in the middle, just making sure that he had a lay of the land 24-7. There was nothing that could happen to that vineyard that God did not know about. He was completely aware morning, noon, and night. And so he takes the people to task and he says, judge between me and my vineyard. You decide. Look what I did for their fruitfulness and for their flourishing, and yet the result was sour grapes. You notice that God did not say that there was no fruit. God said that the fruit was rotten and worthless. Judah and Israel together are likened to God's vineyard. He did everything to make it possible for their health, for their beauty, and that they could thrive. And he expected a harvest of grapes, but they brought forth none of that. The fruit that he expected, like a parent investing in the lives of their children, praying with them, sharing God's word with them, taking them to church, teaching them all that they could about the Lord, and then they grow up and they, they walk away. And sometimes if, if you know what it's like to have a, a prodigal child, you wonder, you ask, you scratch your head and you say, what more could I have done? Yes, I was a weak parent at times. Yes, I failed at times. But Lord, I did my best to point my children to you. And now look, Lord, what is the fruit of their life? And yet we can't say any of those things about the Lord. He wasn't a weak parent. He never failed his children. He did everything with the utmost care and perfection. And yet still they walked away from the Lord. I remember when we first started this series in my introduction, I said, you know, the, the one thing that the, the people of God had in common is that they were always looking over the fence in the world. They were always just wanting a peek at what the world had. And many times they would look over and, and completely forget the blessings of God and say, oh, I want that. I want what the world has. And the book of Judges tells us that everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes, rejecting the law of the Lord, rejecting his best provision for their lives. And what happened? They were in and out of captivity again and again and again. Now I'd like for us to put up that screen of the unhealthy vineyard if we can. This is what God saw when he looked upon the people of Israel. There were thorns. There were briars. God would say, I will not see them any longer as part of a people that I can do anything with. I am going to leave them to themselves. The problem was not that God's people could not flourish and thrive and be fruitful. It's not that they could not, but it's that they would not. This quote by Elizabeth Elliot challenges me to the core. The choice is ours, she says. It depends on our willingness to see everything in God, receive all from his hand, accept with gratitude the portion and the cup he offers. Shall I charge him with a mistake in his measurements or with misjudging the sphere in which I can best learn to trust him? Has he misplaced me? 
Is he ignorant of the things or people which, in my view, hinder my doing his will? The secret is Christ in me, not me in different circumstances. God will cease to care for his vineyard, so they will be left to suffer whatever ruin their sin brings upon them. Israel had already been destroyed, and now Judah will follow in verses 5 through 7. God was at the point where he will let them have their way. Ladies, sometimes it is the very worst thing that God could do for us when he lets us have our way. Proverbs 14, 12, 12 tells us that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So what were these sins that brought God's judgment? We see six woes that will come upon God's people. And the word translated woe is very similar to the English that sounds like, ah, oh, oh. It expresses sadness, pain, grief. What Israel will experience is going to be traumatic, God says. I remember when I was at a retreat at the very beginning of the month of October and my husband had texted me that Israel was under attack. And I remember when I saw that text, I felt that same sense of grief. Oh, and my heart just sank. I grieved for what God's people were experiencing. Let's look at those six woes. We see selfish greed in verse 8, drunkenness in verses 11 through 12, mockery at God's people to judge their sin, verses 18 and 19, distortion of God's moral standards in verse 20, arrogance and pride in verse 21, and perversion of justice in verses 22 and 23. It amazes me at how in the now God's word is. Does that sound familiar to where we're at in our culture? I think we like to pride ourselves that we've evolved with all of our political correctness, but when in fact we have not. These very same sins that God saw in his people Back in Isaiah's day, we have repeated that same cycle to this present moment. God promises that his justice will be carried out upon Jerusalem. And what will be the result? This wicked city will be left in ruins in verses 15 through 17. In Nehemiah 9.26, we read, but they became rebellious and revolted against you and threw your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who had admonished them in order to bring them back to you. And they committed great blasphemies. Whenever you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you see the cycle again and again and again. Man rejecting God, throwing his law behind their backs, and the hardships that follow as a result. The prophet pictures the people of Jerusalem as having so much sin that they pull it along by the cartloads. And some actually boast of the amount of sin that they have committed, and they challenge God to his face to stop them. Oh, yeah, God. Look at me go, you just watch me. Let's just see how much we can get away with, in other words. Others try to reverse God's standards by calling evil good and good evil. They claim that they know everything and have no need of God in verses 20 and 21. Ladies, I can't help but see how we have put new names on sin and the voice of man has justified our wickedness. Romans 1.25 tells us, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature 
rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. God responds by sending an enemy to the nation and their army is so highly disciplined and well equipped that Judah will not be able to escape. Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he or she will also reap. Let's bring this home to us. Have we examined our own fruit lately? Have we prided ourselves in serving on Sunday morning? Have we been looking at the sin of others and picking out the speck in our brother's eyes while we have a log in our own? Have we inspected our own fruit? Maybe there's fruit there, but is it fruit that God is pleased with? Or is it sour and smelling and good for nothing? It was Charles Spurgeon who said, has it been so with us? Have we rewarded the well-beloved ungratefully for all his pains? Have we given him hardness of heart instead of repentance? Unbelief instead of faith? Indifference instead of love? Idleness instead of holy industry? Impurity instead of holiness? Now we move to our second point in chapter 6, the vision. Let's read verses 1 through 8. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. In verse 1, we read about the death of King Uzziah. Let's learn a little bit about this king and what was happening in the moment of his death. During the 10th year of his reign, the king of Judah was a very godly man. Under his influence, the southern kingdom attained power, wealth, success, unlike it had ever enjoyed in the days of Solomon. So he was a good king. God had his hand of blessing upon this man. It would be kind of like, uh, you know, the United States experiencing a great president. The economy's good. Health is going well. Everyone has a job. Unemployment rate is at its lowest. Things are going well. But something happened. This king became proud. His success went to his head. His blessings from the Lord, he began to take advantage of that. Uzziah made the mistake of offering incense in the temple in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. And for that very reason, God struck him with leprosy and he died in that condition. For Isaiah and for the entire nation, it ushered in a time of uncertainty of times that were unprecedented, change, doubt, 
insecurity, what's next? Something so sudden and so unexpected caught Isaiah and the people of God by surprise. Yet, for Isaiah, it was to be a time of rediscovery. Ladies, there are so many times that we doubt what God is doing. Something unexpected happens, something that we hadn't planned for, something that just knocks us right out from under our feet. And yet, if we can see God for who he is, oftentimes he will reveal to us that it's in those very moments that he is going to redirect our focus. Apparently, Isaiah had his focus on Uzziah. But now that Uzziah is dead, his attention is redirected back to the Lord. Even the most godliest men and women are going to experience times where God is going to need to get our attention. What must have been a downtime in the prophet's life and a time of uncertainty is now going to become an uptime. That which had held his attention was removed, and Isaiah had a fresh encounter with God. Have you ever prayed for revival? Have you ever prayed for God to do something extraordinary and miraculous in your life? Oh, God, reawaken my sense of who you are. Shake me up. Stir me, God. Lord, I don't like being in this place where I'm at. I've become complacent and indifferent. And oftentimes, God will send something in our path to do exactly that. But it's not always what we anticipate. Let's look into these familiar verses and learn that when life brings us those down times, how we can get back up and renew our perspective. Number one, we need to see what Isaiah saw. What did he see? Verse 1, he saw God's position. Isaiah saw God in his sovereignty. An earthly king may have died, but the Lord still reigned. How many times did we have to remind ourselves during the pandemic when life just fell apart for everybody globally, financially, health-wise? All of our securities were somehow shaken up, weren't they? And yet, as the people of God, we had to look up and remind ourselves of God's position. He saw the Lord in all his glory, and it had a profound impact in the life of Isaiah. What appeared to be a tragedy to most became the greatest thing that could ever happen in his life. You see, this became the turning point of this great prophet of God. He saw God's position. 2 Corinthians 4.17 tells us, For our momentary light, of aff light affliction is producing, producing, producing. Ladies, it's an ongoing thing producing in us an eternal weight of glory. Far beyond all comparison. All that we could ever ask or think or imagine or conceive, God is doing something far beyond all comparison. Do you believe that? Yes, we must. That is our hope. That is our living hope because of who he is. We are never under our circumstances because God is on the throne. Secondly, he saw God's personality. He saw God's position. He saw God's personality. The angelic beings in the temple proclaimed three times. What did they say? I can't hear you. Holy, holy, holy. holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God. Even those sinless creatures were careful to honor the holiness and the purity of the Lord. Notice that they covered their faces with their wings. You know, we sang a song years and years ago, Come Just As You Are. And I love that song. And it's true. 
Jesus wants us to come just as we are, but he doesn't want to leave us there. We are to be growing, ladies. We are to be being conformed into the image of our Savior. And what does it say about him throughout the word of God? He is holy, holy, holy. We've come to embrace such a casual view of God. We want to bring him to our level instead of us looking up and aspiring to his glory and his holiness and his purity. And yet this is what happened when Isaiah had a fresh encounter with God. They proclaimed the glory of the Lord Isaiah finally understood that Uzziah might have been a good king, but the Lord was the holy God, and he alone deserved the glory for all of life. Ephesians 1.12 tells us that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. You see, we want God to make the most of us. And ladies, we need to make that divine shift and make our lives the most of him. We need to remember that God is the prime characteristic of this universe. In him, we live and move and have our being. And it is for him that we exist Our duty before the Lord is to honor his holy nature by living holy lives. Isaiah learned that this was really not about Uzziah after all, and it was not about him. It was about God. He alone deserves that place of preeminence, that first, that all in all of why we are here. We need to see what Isaiah saw. Next, we need to sense what Isaiah sensed in verses 5 through 7. And what did he say? What did he sense? What did he realize in those moments where he beheld the glory and the position of God? He sensed his own condition. When he saw the Lord, he instantly realized that there were problems in his own heart. In chapter 5, it was, woe is you, woe is you, woe is you. And in chapter 6, he says, woe is me. When we come face to face with who he is and what we are, it will produce humility and confession. And yet, the God of hope the God of love, the God of grace, the God of mercy that he is, holds this out to Isaiah once he recognized that woe was he. He sensed his own need for cleansing, and God offered that to him. Thank God that the Lord does not just point out the sin in our lives. He doesn't stop there. He also provides the means to be cleansed, to be forgiven, and to be made whole. With Isaiah, with Isaiah, that was an angel with a live coal from the altar. And with us, it is the precious blood of Jesus. 1 John 1, 7 tells us, But we walk in the light. If we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And here it is. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all, all, all sin. This is what we have to look forward to when we come before a holy God and we recognize our own wretchedness in light of his great, great goodness. If we ever see him as he is and ourselves for what we are, we will come before him with gratitude, with thanksgiving, and with humility. Then, then we stand in his presence and we receive all that he has for us. 
We need to see what Isaiah saw. We need to sense what Isaiah sensed. And we need to say what Isaiah said. What did he say? What did he say? Here I am. Send me. As soon as Isaiah gets his heart clean, as soon as he has a renewed sense of perspective on who God is, when Isaiah fully understood that although he was a prophet of God, he needed God's pardon and cleansing and forgiveness, and then God granted him that in his abundant faithfulness, he wanted to be God's spokesman in a brand new way. When Isaiah said, here I am, his life was on the altar as a sacrifice to the Lord, never to be taken back again. Romans 12, 1, Paul said, I urge you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God as your spiritual or reasonable service of worship. He's saying, look, it's only reasonable in light of what Christ has done for us, that we present our bodies as an altar, as an offering on that altar. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. And that is where we find Isaiah in this chapter. All of his holy props are gone. Oh yes, he is still the prophet, along with the other prophets who were ministering to God's people at that time. Absolutely but he had a, a renewed sense of his calling. Lord, I am here to do what you want of me. I am willing to do, willing to go, willing to say what you have asked. Send me, let me go. But isn't it interesting how as we continue to read on in that chapter that the Lord did not give Isaiah a whole lot of encouragement he did not promise a really great 401k or success in his ministry or, you know, 10 million followers on YouTube. No, that wasn't the case. Isaiah's ministry would actually make some eyes more blind, some ears more deaf, and some hearts even more calloused. What would my response be if that's what God told me? Oh, you're going to go. I'm going to send you. I'm going to fill you with my spirit. You're going to speak my words, but it's not going to be received. You're going to keep on preaching, but they will not hear. You're going to keep on asking, open your eyes, but they're going to be as blind as ever. God told Isaiah that his ministry would end in seeming failure with the land ruined and the people taken captive by their enemies. So often before we say yes to God, we want to know what's in it for us. Is it going to be successful? Is it going to be received? Am I going to be liked? But a remnant would survive. That was God's promise. A remnant would survive. It would be like the stump of a fallen tree from which the shoots, that holy seed would come and they would continue the true faith in the land. God was saying, look, it's not going to be easy. Your message is not going to be received universally. But there's going to be a remnant because I have called it so. And this is what it's going to be. There is going to be a seed. There is going to be a stump. However small it may seem, however insignificant it might look, and yet these are my chosen people that I am going to restore from their captivity, and they will carry on according to the promise of Abraham and David. And that holy seed ultimately, as we will see in our next chapter, Verses, uh, chapters 7 through 9, that holy seed, our Emmanuel, our God with us, our Jesus. 
It was D.L. Moody who said, the world has yet to see what God can do with and for and through a man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. Isaiah became that man who was fully consecrated to God. And now his journey would continue, but he had a restored and a renewed sense of perspective of who God was, seated on his throne, high and lifted up, his glory filling the, the temple, and the angels crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. God, take me where, where you will. Do with me as you choose. I am yours. In conclusion, ladies, more than ever, the church needs to see what Isaiah saw, to sense what Isaiah sensed, and to say what Isaiah said, here I am, Lord, send me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for just reminding us of your glory. Lord, we see this world around us, Lord, and we are so tempted to want to be like the people, your chosen ones, God, who just rejected you and threw their law behind their backs. Oh, but God, make us Isaiahs, make us men and women, Father, who behold your glory, exalted, high and lifted up, and willing to say, here I am, Lord, send me. And God, when we need our cleansing, when we need those moments where we need to be restored, help us to humbly come before you and confess, woe is me. And Lord, find your restoration, find your forgiveness, find your mercy, and find your willingness to equip us to carry on and to carry out this message to a dark and dying world. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Will you ladies stand as you sing this last song?
Thank you, small groups. God bless you.